Something's going to happen. Something wonderful. G'day fans and welcome to an exciting Wednesday night for Talk Nerdy To Me. So instead of having it on Fridays, we're now on Wednesdays. It's exciting. There are people joining us already. That's how committed they are. The numbers are screaming up. Absolutely fantastic. But before we get too far, I've got to introduce my co-hosts. We've got MPS and Jeffro. Lads, how are we tonight? We're excellent. This is actually a presentation I uh, asked Jeffro to put together. Uh, it's actually to do with a Ray Harryhausen, who's a visual effects pioneer back in the day. And I actually requested him to do this because I thought one of the things that we want to do in this show is ensure that we don't just talk about the here and now and that we actually do cover the past and, you know, science fiction history from way, way, way back when and that it doesn't get forgotten or uh, omitted uh, or overlooked, as is often the case of these days. Plus, it's something a little bit different, unique, and you may learn something you didn't know before about the great man. So hopefully, Jeffro's internet survives to this presentation because I have no idea what he was planning to say. But uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to say uh, over to Jeffro. So there you go. You know, I'm going to get the Thank screen up. Thank you very much, Dad. So uh, I'm hoping that, uh, as said, with my son off the uh, internet, we may actually have some luck. So... Um, I'm just wondering how many people actually have uh, seen much of uh, Ray Harryhausen's uh, work. So if you haven't, I'd just be curious to see if you put a little note there up on the uh, the comments just to say, well, no, I haven't seen him. So that just gives us a bit of an idea as to uh, who's familiar with him and who isn't. So that, that would be good. So uh, Ray Harryhausen was born in Los Angeles in 1920. Um, it was a golden era to be able to uh, uh, see something like The Lost World in 1925 and King Kong in 1933 on the big screen. And for someone of that impressionable age, it just uh, it just caught a hold of him. And he was just so fascinated with the, um, the process of the stop motion and making things like dinosaurs and giant gorillas come to life. So... For him, his first taste of getting into trying to mimic that sort of uh, uh, creation he was seeing on screen began for him when he was 15 years old. At the age of uh, 15, he borrowed some camera gear and uh, with a 16mm black and white uh, camera, he made a short film. So this was uh, a subject where he had a giant cave bear and uh, the cave bear was actually attacking his dog, uh, his dog, which he named uh, Kong. So a nice little tribute. So, you know, really young age. Can you imagine making that kind of thing at 15? These days, I mean, it must be fairly hard, but, you know, in the 1930s, what an impressive way to start. So um, next we have the... Um, a scene out of one of the um, uh, the movies that I mentioned, and this one is from the, uh, the the movie The Lost World. So this is this is the movie in which uh, the effects were done by a gentleman by the name of Willis O'Brien. So Willis O'Brien uh, did this, The Lost World, and also he did uh, King Kong, which uh, that's where his uh, reputation was um, was sealed. And uh, at the tender age of 18, uh, Ray Harryhausen got to meet Willis O'Brien. Yep. Yep. So, then you give them a call. And I uh, said he was... Mm. He was able to meet his, um, as I said, his, uh, his idol. There we go. Okay. All right, so um, next we have in the, uh, the pictures, a, this is just an example of uh, uh, Willis O'Brien sort of working on set. So uh, it's, as you can see, it's a modest setup with the, um, uh, the, the figures, just a small camera, essentially a, uh, a tabletop. And the uh, thing is that they just have to very slowly 
change the movement of the uh, the arms and the neck and the tail and all that to, to such a small degree that it would slowly, once they uh, rolled the film, make the uh, animals appear to be moving in real life. So um, next we have a uh, picture of the um, one of the, uh, the sets. So again, you can see that they've got the uh, uh, the buildings there, and this this one here is for a um, a production that uh, Ray Harryhausen got to work on with George Powell. So George Powell, you may well remember for uh, many classic movies in the uh, the fifties and all that, but he actually got uh, uh, his career started early on doing something called puppet tunes, where they used uh, wooden um, figures, uh, puppets essentially, to be able to create the, uh, the short film. So that's where uh, uh, Ray essentially got his first sort of, I guess, uh, gigging work, uh, working with um, uh, George Powell at the, uh, the Paramount Studios. However, uh, uh, working with the wooden puppets wasn't really his style. Uh, having worked with... Um, and seeing Willis O'Brien work with metal armatures just meant that uh, they ended up sort of, uh, I said, uh, he ended up deciding to, to move from that. So uh, the, uh, the next one we have is um, a picture of uh, Ray Harryhausen there. And uh, this is from the movie uh, Mighty Joe Young. So uh, essentially it's a sequel to King Kong that uh, he actually uh, finally got to be able to work uh, and sort of do the, uh, the special effects with uh, Willis O'Brien sharing the work uh, that they were doing to uh, animate uh, Mighty Joe Young. So uh, this was uh, the second and uh, last time that he actually got to work with um, his, his idol. So he did actually work on the Puppetoons um, series with, uh, with O'Brien but this was the uh, the second or last time he got to work with his idol in the uh, the next one we have this is the uh the movie in which uh he got a chance to do something that was solely his efforts and uh first you know, essentially his first uh feature so this is uh now 1953 and as the title card says it's the piece from 20,000 fathoms so it's noted that this is actually the first picture that involves a beast that has essentially been uh, awoken as a result of an atomic bomb. So this movie actually came out about 18 months before uh, Godzilla actually used that same sort of premise. So that's, um, that's its little claim to fame. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, the American Film Institute has actually got this listed in its top 10 science fiction films of all time so uh it's a modest picture but uh it certainly uh, has a lot of fans and um and uh, it's worth seeing if you want to start off with uh looking at harry Housen's career okay so with the uh the next slide we have the man that essentially uh boosted harry Housen's career and worked with him for the rest of his professional life. So this this is a gentleman by the name of Charles H. Schneer. So he was actually a, uh, a producer and uh, the two were int introduced uh, by a mutual friend in the army. So, and this is, as I said, the two guys here uh, began what was essentially to be uh, a celebrated partnership of uh, teamwork between Schneer doing the producing and Harry Housen doing the, uh, the effects. So the next one we have is their uh, first collaboration, which is uh, uh, It Came From Beneath the Sea and was originally titled Monster From Beneath the Sea. So as you can sort of tell from the uh, image, it's all about a uh, giant octopus that uh, comes and wreaks havoc, havoc, I should say, on the, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. The interesting thing with this one is just to save money, uh, instead of having eight tentacles, they actually uh, only put six on the actual uh, uh, giant octopus itself, and they hoped that uh, nobody would ever notice. And 
and some people did, but uh, essentially uh, it was the um, uh, just one way of saving money, but uh, still effective to see all those tentacles going all over the place. The, uh, uh, the next production that they got involved with is uh, a big favourite of mine, and I, I think sort of uh, hopefully some of the other people that we have uh, here as well, Earth versus the Flying Saucers. So um, I wonder how many people actually haven't seen this because I said it just seems to be one of those ones that uh, it's on the must-see, I think, for most science fiction fans. But uh, as you can sort of see, um, lots of flying saucers and the flying saucers were attacking uh, Washington and there's some brilliant elaborate special effects. So you get to see the, uh, uh, the flying saucers when they're... Um, being zapped with the uh, special ray that they use to sort of uh, to stabilize the, uh, the the flying saucers, you get to see them crash into things like the Washington Monument and uh, and other sort of uh, uh, buildings which everyone sort of knew, and just to see them crashing into um, uh, the White House and all and the Washington Monument and all the other things, it's quite amazing to be able to see. The next one we have is. Uh, a movie called 20 Million Miles to Earth. And I, I picked this one because it's interesting with the poster, you never actually get to see the face. So this was sort of uh, basically their, their attempt to sort of show you a teaser, but not actually the full creature. So uh, 20 Million Miles to Earth was 1957. And uh, this is a movie where Ray wanted it to be filmed in colour. But unfortunately, he wasn't able to get the budget to be able to do it at the time. So the interesting thing is that back in 2007, when it got a DVD release, uh, he was actually actively involved in um, helping with the, uh, the project to get it colorized. And that's actually... Um, uh, oh, something um, now on the DVD. So... Um, the next one is actually the picture of the creature itself. So there it is. So that's actually uh, the head of the the beast. So someone's I'll actually just mentioned it because obviously the post. Yeah, someone's actually mentioned it's the Venus yeah. monster. I don't know if that's correct or not. Oh, uh, the monster actually came from Venus. So yeah, Pretty that's good. probably um, that's probably what it is. Okay, so the, um, and the creature's name is Ymir, so it's always hard to pronounce, but uh, that's, that's the name of the creature. Okay, the, uh, the next one is uh, a, a bit more obscure. This is one that they didn't really um, have much involvement with, but uh, it involved uh, giant spiders. So the, uh, the, the production company uh, got Harry Harryhausen to actually animate uh, giant spiders, but but uh, technically, it's something that he did work on. So, uh, well, I thought I'd better uh, throw that in. So, uh, yeah, Cosmic Monsters uh, with Forrest Tucker from um, F Troop. Anyway, the next one. Um, I'm seeing Michelle's comment there. Unfortunate shadow placement. I'm not sure if that was related to that or to that. So, uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I can do shadow puppets. <laughs> okay, so now... Now we get into um, uh, the series of films that um, Schneer and Harry House are the most famous. As you can see, just on the, um, the title card underneath, it, it's got Dynamation. So Dynamation was something that he essentially created as a means to be able to blend in his uh, stop motion. With um, a special technique, he actually, as I said, dubbed it Dynamation. Do you realise when Jeffro freezes up, he's his own version of Dynamation? Um, on the card there. <laughs> One frame at a time. Yeah. Uh, I shall have yep. sure my son um, doesn't use the internet uh, on Wednesdays. Uh, so the... Uh, the next uh, one we have is a scene from the uh, the movie. Uh, so here you can see that he's actually, um, as I said, just working on a very modest tabletop. 
the uh, the creature uh, there. So uh, his his work, I mean, it's it takes a year and a half sometimes to be able to do all the effects in a film. And if you can just imagine him sort of working on a table, having to lean over, not very good for the back, and having to sort of make those minor minor moves to the uh, the characters, it must have been an arduous work. And I think that's where I think fans of Harryhausen sort of uh, go, we appreciate that, you know, this was a difficult, hard job, and to be able to pull it off and make it so spectacular, I think that's where sort of uh, he earned all his uh, kudos. So with the uh, the next slide, here we go. That's um, Ray with uh, one of the uh, the skeletons. Now skeletons uh, became a uh, a big thing uh, for him. So this one is uh, one of the skeletons that uh, was in the movie, but uh, in one of his later ones, he basically upped the game, and we got to see seven skeletons on the um, on the go at one time. So. Um, Next slide we have is um, a little bit uh, uh, different. So we have the three worlds of Gulliver. So based on the the, uh, the classic novel, uh, there was many aspects to that where his talents were uh, used. And as you can see on this one, it's super dynamation. So I'm not too sure why he changed the name, but uh, as I said, it just got... Um, it got changed up a little bit. So uh, that's uh, that was his next project. Now, the um, next one we have is Mysterious Island. So that was, uh, we're now looking at uh, in the early 60s, uh, based off the, uh, the Jules Verne uh, stories. There was actually two stories that it was based off of with uh, Captain Nemo. So uh, not one that I recall uh, seeing all that often, but as I said, uh, um, certainly one in his repertoire. Now, the next slide has one of the characters that uh, we see. So essentially, it's a giant chicken. So uh, I thought that just looks suitably ugly that I'd throw in that slide just to uh, show you one of the, uh, the scary characters that uh, uh, was called the giant bird. But uh, yeah, that's uh, from, this, from uh, Mysterious Island. The next one is the uh, the big one, Jason and the Argonauts. So, going back to the um, the mythology adventures, this one was in uh, 1963 and was a huge hit film. So, uh, it really um, it did well at the uh, the box office. And uh, I said it's one of one of his more popular titles that people tend to uh, to, to quote and um, and and have seen. So. Uh, Moving along, one of the famous scenes that everyone remembers, as we said before, uh, is the, uh, the seven skeletons uh, at attacking. So uh, to be able to achieve that kind of level of um, stop motion animation, I mean, it's it's probably the, uh, as I said, uh, the most memorable thing I think he's ever done. And whenever anyone sort of thinks of Harry Housen, it's usually that scene. Now, if anybody sure there, you, uh, sorry. If anybody is watching and doing a count and go, hang on, there's not seven skeletons are there, that's because there's more, there's actually actually a couple uh, fighting off screen with another guy. Okay. So there you go. That's true. Okay. So the next one we have in the, um, the movies is uh, First Men in the Moon. So based on the HG Wells uh, story. Um, and we're going back to, as the title says, they're just dynamation instead of super dynamite. This thing, if um, anyone knows the um, the writer of Quatermass, now that's 50s and we're talking about 50s and 60s, uh, that uh, this one was actually instigated by Nigel Neal, who was the writer of uh, Quatermass, Quatermass. So they managed to convince uh, Schneer to actually make this movie. So he wasn't enthused, but uh, as I said, they got this one made because uh, Nigel Neal was uh, so enthusiastic, as was Harryhausen. So uh, the way they um, they worked with the actors is that on this one, Harryhausen was actually on the set. And what he would do is he would actually describe uh, what the creature was that 
that supposedly would be acting in front of them. So essentially he was he was on there coaching them to say, well, this is what it's going to do. This is what it's going to look like. It's going to be moving this way. So he actually um, was very much involved on set as well as off set. So I thought that was just uh, an interesting little bit of trivia. The uh, the next one we have is uh, Raquel Welsh in uh, 100 million years BC. This is... Um, uh, a little bit different in so much as this was done um, for the Hammer people. And um, did he get to animate quite... Raquel like frame by frame or something? Um, I don't think she needed any animating. I think she bounced around enough as it was, so by her own accord. So, uh, but uh, as you can see in the background, you know, dinosaurs being one year, one, you know, one million years BC goes without saying that. Uh, Harry Housen loved dinosaurs, and of course, this was certainly uh, in his uh, his ballpark. There's an interesting quote that uh, he said, and I'll just read it out. So he's saying, he said, uh, one million years BC is not made for professors who probably don't see these kind of movies anyway. So he recognised, you know, there may be some uh, flaws in the scientific aspects. But, you know, he's making it for uh, the people that go see the, uh, the movies and, and eat their popcorn. So, yeah, he, he appreciate that maybe there's some, you know, sort of creative uh, use in some of the dinosaurs and other uh, other creatures. But, yeah, that, um, that, that's not a bad movie. I, I saw that not too long ago. The next one we have, getting still into uh, dinosaurs, is the Valley of the Kugongi. So I think the headline there pretty much says it all. Uh, Cowboys battle monsters in the lost world of the Forbidden Valley. So you read that and you think, that doesn't sound like much. It almost sounds like um, Cowboys versus Aliens versus um, Dinosaurs. So it, it's not a great movie. Uh, this was made in 69 and, um, and even... Uh, um, Harry Housen and Schneer sort of said, well, this is probably the least favourite movie that they've ever done, but it is what it is. It's part of his, um, uh, his, his, uh, uh, his movie collection, so we have to put it in. Okay, they did redeem themselves with the next movie. Oh, that's it. So with the next uh, one week. Oops. Oh, okay, so... Um, the next one was uh, the Golden Voyage of Sinbad. So um, that was made in '73, and um, in this in this movie, he was actually given co-producer credit to sort of recognise how much of an input that uh, he actually did in the uh, the movie. So he actually also uh, had heavy involvement in things like the editing, the writing, and the so uh, that was '73. '77 uh, we saw Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. So, um, 77, of course, being the year of Star Wars, I think sort of they, they timed that pretty well because we, we know that uh, obviously there's a lot of science fiction fans out there and fantasy. Uh, and essentially, they uh, uh, hit big time on that one. That was probably their biggest movie uh, at the time and, uh, and, and made, th uh, I think it was uh, 300 was made for $3.5 million, but it made something like $50 million at the box office. So it was, it was very well received. Uh, and then from 1977, it was not until 1981 that we saw his last final movie, which was Clash of the Titans. So um, this is one that I remember seeing in the, uh, the, the cinemas. I can't recall whether I saw either time Tiger in the cinemas, uh, but I certainly do remember seeing this one and being blown away on the big screen uh, to be able to sort of see it. So this was the um, the costliest movie ever made for for Schneer and Harry Housen. They were lucky when they were shopping it around that they, whilst they got knocked back by uh, some of the studios, uh, one of the things is that Orion Pictures originally wanted. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger to play the lead, but um, Schneer said, no, that's not going to happen. Um, and then they said, uh, just as well, because there's probably too much dialogue anyway. So... Oh, 
I think he's frozen right at the very end. How about he that? Got, he, he got looked at by the Medusa. Played by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Here we go. Yeah. So, yes, well done, MPS. Uh, so it was actually picked up by MGM, and they were very good. So they not only improved uh, uh, approved budget increases, but also uh, additional spending on the uh, the cast. And when you look at the cast, it's a real who's who of uh, A-grade actors. So they're very fortunate to be able to get that. Now, at the time, Clash of Titans was released um, and $5 million from 1100 uh theaters in its opening weekend. So just the opening weekend. And interestingly enough, it was second only behind Raiders. So Raiders also got released on the same date. So eventually, at the end of the day, once the film had been shown worldwide, it grossed over $60 million and was also uh, credited as one of 1981's biggest hits. So that is the kind of legacy that you want to see uh, when you uh, essentially uh, have the career such as Ray Harryhausen to go out on um, such a high. So that is uh, the man, Ray Harryhausen, and uh, thank you so much. Well done. Even though we got through a few sort of stutters and spotters, you're actually doing your own dynamation there with a little bit of stop motion animation on the Jeffro, so that's all good. Um, it's very interesting because uh, yeah. Simon Tiger was one of the rare occasions where they actually had um, a supporting character with the leads actually walking around with them uh, rather than just as like a, the odd monster here and the odd monster there, which was actually uh, really well done. So that was actually um, quite revolutionary. Uh, and, of course, the one thing that uh, Ray Harryhausen once said regarding his visual effects work, especially once we got into the 1980s, uh, where, you know, special effects in uh, the industry with the industrial light and magic and all the rest of it became a really big thing, he said it now takes 100 people to do the same work that he used to do all by himself. And uh, how's that for a testament yeah. and, a, and a statement to make? So, uh, and and that was a good thing about it because he didn't just do creatures and monsters. He did, as you mentioned, in Earth versus the Flying Saucer. He actually did do flying saucers and the destruction of buildings and everything else. And that was actually very, very groovy. Um, somebody actually asked what visual effects that were occurring in one million years BC. And as Jeffrey mentioned, there's actually monsters in the background. They pop up from time to time. Uh, totally scientifically inaccurate, but that doesn't matter. Good for the entertainment. So. Uh, very good stuff. And as Phil Nichols has been pointing out, a whole lot of Doctor Who actors had appeared in a whole lot of movies that Ray Harry hasn't had worked in. So uh, those Doctor Who guys, they really get around. What can I say? Fantastic stuff. There you go. Anyway, mm -hmm. we're going to hold off. See you there. Nerd is the word. I like that. Nerd is the word. Uh, W-E-R-D. Very, very nerd. nerd, 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 nerd is That's the word. Really Look at that. Nerd is the word. I love that. How very, very cool. All right, so uh, very good. All right, so we're going to see you next week. Uh, and remember, stay nerdy, okay? Party hard and rock on. See ya. Wait. <laughs>